Hi, and welcome to the Module 1, Section 8 video. This is a, a, a video, a learning video on uh, force of interest, the general case of the force of interest. Video go, is going to get quite long if I try to put it all in one video, so I've got it split up into two parts. This is part one. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about force of interest and the constant uh, uh, framework. So we had a delta that represented a constant force of interest, and you can think of that delta as the uh, uh, continuously compounded interest rate. Now I want to generalize that a little bit, so I'm going to denote this, uh, I'm going to add a declaration of a subscript of T on my delta, and I'm going to call this the general force of interest. And once again, just like with delta, T is going to be measured uh, in years. Uh, so delta T, I'm adding the T though because the uh, let's say I, I plug in a 2 for t, then delta sub 2 will give me a numeric value for the force of interest at time 2, which might be a different number than a delta sub 1, for instance, which would be the force of interest uh, at, at time 1 or after, after one year. So I have a different value for delta for the force of interest at different times, and that's why I need the extra decoration. And that's why you can see that, uh, you know, if I just use a delta, it, it's independent of t. It doesn't matter what time you're talking about, it's going to give you the same value. Okay, so delta sub t is going to be my notation for the general force of interest. I'm going to quit saying the word general, and just when I refer to force of interest, I mean this, this delta t. Okay, the definition for delta t is that it's, it's defined in terms of the accumulation function by you take the ratio of the derivative of the accumulation function to the accumulation function. So it's this fraction. Numerator is the derivative of the accumulation function and the denominator is the accumulation function. Let's look at a few examples. Let's suppose that a of t is a 1 plus i times t. Now you should recognize that as the accumulation function for simple interest. And so we, you know, what we're about to do then is let's, let's look at what the force of interest would be at time t uh, for in a simple interest scenario here. So in the numerator, I need to take the derivative of uh, 1 plus i times t. Let me make another comment here, is that when I saw, say derivative in this uh, video, I mean the derivative with respect to t. t is my independent variable. I see an i there, but i I'm thinking as, as some fixed, but maybe it's unknown, maybe I didn't give it to you, but it's a fixed value, it's not a variable. t is the, is the independent variable here. It's what we're taking the derivative with respect to. So this is very easy in the numerator. When you take the derivative of one plus i times t with respect to t, you just get an i. In the denominator, you just write the expression for the accumulation function, which is a one plus i times t. And so i divided by one plus i times t is the force of interest uh, that corresponds to a simple interest uh, context. Okay, uh, let's look at another example. You should recognize this example as a simple discount uh, case. So 1 minus d times t to the minus 1, the reciprocal of 1 minus d times t, is the, uh, it, it's the expression that defines the accumulation function uh, when, we're in a, when we're using simple discount. Okay, so now what about the force of interest at time t in this case? In the numerator, I need to take the derivative of this expression. In the denominator, I just have the expression that defines the accumulation function. Numerator, the derivative is a little bit trickier here because I've got to use a power rule, and then within the power rule, I have to use a chain rule. So I bring the minus 1 down. I have a minus 1 times 1 minus d times t to the minus 2 power, and then times the derivative of what's in the parentheses uh, with respect to t, so that's the minus d. The minus in front of the d and the minus in front of the whole expression will cancel each other out. So I'm in the numerator, I've got this d, and then you can play around with the, uh, with the exponents there. And you should see then that the force of interest at time t then when we're uh, when we we're given a com when we're given a simple discount, the for force of interest is a d divided by a one minus d times t. Okay, let's look at a third example. What if I had an accumulation function that was a b to the t power? Uh, so this is a stand. I'm going to call this a standard exponential. Uh, standard. Uh, I'm calling it standard because the exponent is a t. It's not like a three t or a two t or or it's just a t by itself. And I'm using a b there because I'm thinking of that as the base. So uh, a of t is equal to uh, some base raised to the t power. And then the question is, well, what's the uh, force of interest at time t? So I've got to take the derivative.
derivative of this b to the t in the numerator, and you've got to go back to calculus and what's uh, you know remember what's the derivative of this general exponential of b to the t, and that answer is it, it's b to the t times the natural log of the base there times the natural log of b. The b to the t's cancel off in the numerator and the de denominator, and so I end up with just uh, that the force of interest is uh, is the natural log of b. Now I want to spend a little bit more time on this on this example, so let me kind of capture all this information uh, in, in a single line here. A of t is equal to some base b raised to the t power. In that case, if that's true, then the force of interest is uh, um, the force of interest is the natural log of the base. Okay, so uh, hang with me for just a second, and, and uh, I want to uh, I want to get back to some other language for this for this particular uh, fact. And so I want to uh, I want to kind of get there by looking at what the periodic accumulation factor is from time k to k plus one. Um, uh, again, uh, plug in a k plus one for t here. Plug in a k for t, and you'll see that uh, the periodic accumulation factor uh, from k to k plus one is is the ratio of b to the k plus one to b to the k. The b to the k's will cancel off, and I'm just left with a b. Ah, now now now, what about that b? That's that same base that's in that implication above. And uh, there's one more thing I can say about this uh, this periodic accumulation factor, and because it's not, I, I know what the period is. It's measured in years. So this is actually just an annual accumulation factor. From k to k plus 1, that's one period, one year in this case. So this b is an annual accumulation factor. So I can rewrite the implication this way. If the accumulation function is, an, is exponential, if it's an exponential function, then the force of interest is going to be the natural log of the annual accumulation factor. So let me replace the implication below the definition with this 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 line and this is what I want to remember and and now let's look at some specific situations that this would apply to for instance, what if we were compounding? Uh, what if we're uh, continuously compounding interest? Then our accumulation function is e to the... Now, I didn't put a delta there. I just want to... Let's go back but, and let's say that we don't have any uh, prior knowledge of this delta to begin with. And we're going to use an r like we did, you know, like you did you know, when you first learn the stuff. So the accumulation function is a of t equals e to the rt. Well, then the one-year accumulation factor or the annual, accumula annual accumulation factor is going to be e to the r, and then that's going to make the uh, that's going to make delta t the force of interest is the natural log of this annual accumulation factor. So in the natural log of e to the r is just that r value. Notice that that's constant, uh, and being a constant, I'm just going to call that a delta now instead of an r uh, because I'm using delta t as the the general. Uh, force of interest at any time t, and if it's the same value, I just might as well just call it delta without putting the t there. Now, I want to I want to arrive at the same conclusion another way. Let's go back to just the uh, standard, you know, the the accumulation function being defined as e to the r t. Now, let's just use the definition. We've got the definition sitting there. This is an easy enough problem that we can just use the definition. Uh, what's the derivative of the accumulation function if it's defined by e to the r times t? The other well, derivative would be e to the r times t times an r. And then when I take the ratio of e to, uh, of r times e to the r t to just e to the r t, I just I'm right back to the same result that I've got the force of interest at time t is a constant, uh, and and then I'm just going to call that constant a delta instead of a uh, instead of an r. So now I'll go back and I'll, I'll write the accumulation function as just an e to the uh, delta t. Uh, as the expression that defines the accumulation function. Okay, now what about if we're discrete compounding? Now, whether you're compounding interest or compounding discount, uh, the, the process is going to be the same. So I want to illustrate this with, uh, let, let, let me illustrate this by supposing that we're given a D upper 12. In other words, suppose that we're given a nominal rate of discount compounded monthly. What would I do in this situation in order to get the uh, force of interest uh, in, in here. Well, uh, the force of interest, um, well, let, let, I, I kind of got ahead of myself. What's, what, we're, what are we going to do first when we have a D upper 12? Well, we're going to divide it by 12 and get the monthly effective discount rate. And once I have the monthly effective discount rate, I end up with, uh, I, I know that the 
uh, accumulation fu uh, function is defined by 1 minus d to the minus t power. Now, that's exponential. It's not a standard exponential, but it is exponential. And the t is not even measured in years in this case. The t is measured in months. But the line below that definition still holds true. And that is that the force of interest at time t will be equal to the natural log of the annual accumulation factor. So what I need is the annual accumulation factor in this context. Well, uh, from D being a monthly discount factor, um, uh, I kind of got behind myself. That's exponential, so I'm going to be able to use this fact. From D being the monthly effective discount rate, the monthly effective discount rate, then the monthly accumulation factor would be a 1 minus D to the minus 1. That's the monthly accumulation factor. So the annual accumulation factor would be that times itself 12 times, which would be 1 minus D to the minus 12. And so I know the force of interest then at time T in this case would be the natural log of this annual accumulation factor, the natural log of, of this uh, 1 minus D to the minus 12. Um, if you wanted to, I mean, you could leave it like that. If you wanted to, you could bring the minus 12 down and write this as a minus 12 times the ln of 1 minus d. One comment that I'd like to make about this last expression, uh, it might look like it's a negative value, but the fact of the matter is that the argument of that natural logarithm, which is 1 minus d, you know, d is a value between 0 and 1, so 1 minus d is, is also going to be between 0 and 1. Take the ln of a number between 0 and 1, and you're going to get a negative number. So the negative 12 is actually needed to make that that product positive. These forces of interest will never be negative values. They're always going to be, uh, be positive values. So, so um, uh, that product needs to be positive. So the ln of 1 minus d is actually itself a negative value. So the minus 12 is, is, is needed to make that, that product a positive. Okay, so uh, this is my, my, you know, this is where we're at. We've got a definition. The definition of the force of interest is that delta t is, a, is the derivative of the accumulation function divided by the accumulation function where the time is measured in years. And it, for the rest of the video, I'd like to kind of give you a motivation for the definition. I don't think it's going to take very long to do, um, but I'd like to, to, to show you that motivation. Let's look at a timeline starting at time, uh, at time t. A, and I'm going to look at per dollar invested at time zero. And so in other words, I'm looking at a one a, per, per one at time zero. So at time t, that dollar at time zero will have accumulated to an A of t. And I want to look over a period of delta t years later. And so the, the, the next value on my timeline would be at t plus delta t. And of course, at that time, I have an accumu accumulated amount uh, at that time too. Now, delta t, if you look at the picture, you might think of delta t as, is, is, a, is a big number, but I'm actually thinking of delta t as being a really, really, really small number. Okay, so now let's look what happens between these two time values. The difference between the amounts are, are the accumulated values at time uh, t plus delta t and t. I didn't put any more money into the account, so the, the, the difference between those two amounts is due to the amount of interest that's earned uh, during that time period. And so I could think, so, I, so the, the amount of interest is actually equal to the difference between a of t plus delta t and a of t. Now, on the other hand, I can approximate uh, what the amount of interest is by using the principal times rate times time. And I'm thinking of this as a force of interest. So I'm thinking of principal as being at the beginning of the period, A of T. The, the rate the rate is the force of interest at time t, so that's that delta t, and then the time period is, is the capital delta t there. And so I'm, I'm going to uh, approximate, I'm going to rewrite these, uh, uh, take the right-hand side of, of both of those equations there, and they'll be approximately equal to each other. The right-hand side is, a, is an approximation of the amount of interest that's earned over that period. The left-hand side is the actual, the, the, uh, the actual amount of interest that's earned. And you can kind of uh, see that uh, uh, maybe the derivative is, 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 is coming to light here. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to do is divide both sides by a delta t. On the left-hand side, I got this difference quotient that you should have seen before from calculus. And on the right-hand side, I just have an a of t times delta t. The point here is that when you, when you take smaller and smaller and smaller values of delta t, you're getting a better and better and better approximation there. And so what that means is that as the limit as delta t goes to zero of this difference quotient, I actually get equal... Uh, it, it's, I, I get an equality to the right-hand side. And, and of course, the left-hand side, now you, you recognize that as the, uh, uh, the derivative of A of T. So that's A prime of T. Um, 
And now at this point, I just divide by both sides by A of T, and there's your motivation for the, for the definition of, of the uh, general force of interest. One last comment here is that uh, in, in this, uh, at this point, uh, you have the, the force of interest defined in terms of the accumulation function. In other words, if I give you the accumulation function, you ought to be able to tell me what the force of interest is at, at a general point in time because you know how to take the derivative of it and you just take the, the ratio, the derivative divided by itself. So if I, give you the if I give you the accumulation function, you should be able to give me the force of interest. That's, that's, that's kind of the easy way. In the next video, what we're going to do is I'm going to give, uh, we're going to think of it as reversing the direction. What if I gave you the force of interest? How would you recover the accumulation function uh, from there? So that's a, a little bit generally, a little bit harder problem. So we'll address that in the, uh, in the next video. I'll see you then.